Hi, and welcome to the Imperfect Podcast. My name is Deb Crow, and I will be your host. Join me on this journey as we meet heart-centered leaders from all over the globe. Lots of interesting questions, interesting conversation, and find out what makes a leader. How do they handle uncertainty and complexity? How do they lead in a time that is volatile? Join us. Welcome back to Imperfect, the Heart-Centered Leadership Podcast. And today is a special, special interview for me. I have Jim Papoulis with me today, and I want to introduce him, but I I had the honor and privilege of meeting him when I had my previous podcast. So it's a bit of a serendipitous moment for me today to, to have Jim back on the show. So let me tell you a little bit about him. Jim has made significant contributions to choral music by revitalizing the choral repertoire with songs whose roots are classical and world with voicing that incorporates lead vocalist with choirs, vocal percussion, and world rhythms. His choral work often is sung from the perspective of the singer and is constantly inspired by the work he does through the Foundation for Small Voices. Jim firmly believes that music can heal, educate, celebrate, and empower the lives of children. Through the Foundation for Small Voices, Jim has conducted songwriting workshops with choirs from the United States, China, Japan, Tanzania, Mexico, Kenya, Newfoundland, Trinidad, Dominion Republic, Haiti, England, Norway, Canada, Spain, Italy, Kenya, Uganda, Turkey, Brazil, France, Ireland, Bosnia, Jordan, Australia, Holland, Dubai, and Greece. Jim has worked with choirs and ensembles on all continents and from all walks of life, and he's also had the privilege to work with Aretha Franklin, Celine Dion, Beyonce, the New York Philharmonic Choir, Chicago Symphony, London Boys Choir, the London Symphony, Beijing Children's Choir, Faith Hill, Natalie Cole, Snoop Dogg, Imagine Dragons, Tokyo String Quartet, the Moscow Philharmonic, Portland Symphony, and the New World Symphony. Jim's music has been featured worldwide at the 2019 Cara Festa Port of Spain, Trinidad, the Give Us Hope permanent exhibit at the 9-11 Museum in New York, the 9-11 10th anniversary concerts throughout the world, including New York, Moscow, Tokyo, Beijing, London, Oslo, Paris, Shanghai, Rio, Rome, Salzburg, St. Petersburg, Dubai, Delhi, Oslo, and Paris. Jim's work has also been at the Beijing Olympics, the 2008 presidential inauguration, and the Pope visit televised nationally at Yankee Stadium and at the World Cup South Africa 2010. Jim, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. I almost think I need a drink after that introduction. Wow, wow, wow. (laughs) Yeah, I haven't heard that in a long time. It was sort of interesting to remember all those things. Oh, Um, Jim, you you have just made such a, such an imprint on this world. And my first leadership question for you is, please share with the listeners where your love of music come from and how it's made you a heart-centered leader. Yeah, well, um, I mean, music has always been a part of my life as a child growing up. It was, uh, you know, my my dad is a scientist, but he loved playing music. My mom is from, neither of my parents are from America. My mom grew up in Africa. My dad grew up in Greece. So they brought all kinds of interesting uh, musical backgrounds and Swahili and French songs and Greek songs. And music was always a part, always played with my sisters. I had four sisters. We all played chamber music together and we sang. So it was always a part of my, my life growing up. And, and I really changed. Uh, I went as a math and music major uh, to college. Well, my dad's a mathematician scientist. So I was studying math and he, 
he is the one being a true Greek. He saw that I, that I uh, would write music in my spare time. And he said, he said, uh, he said, you know, if, if music is where your heart is, you really need to, you, you need to do something that's going to inspire you in your life. So if that's what really moves you in your spare time, you're doing music, I would switch to music. And I didn't realize how rare that was because uh, most people are like, most parents are like, what is this music stuff? How are you going to get a job? You know? And, and But my dad being a, being a true Greek, he said, if that's where your heart is and that's where you resonate, that's what you should do because you should apply yourself there. So that was a turning point in my life. My sophomore year in college, I'll never forget it. It was my spring break. And that just veered me off into doing what I really felt was true to my heart. And, and I think that's just very important for anyone, you know? Oh, well, I think it's sound advice. And, and like you said, not a traditional conversation that parents would have. And mm -hmm. it's just so lovely that you followed your heart. And my next question is, what imperfections, Jim, do you think you bring to your heart-centered leadership? What, what is that word? Did you say imperfections? Imperfections. So you are saying, what imperfections do I yeah. bring? Hence, hence, the name, hence the name of the podcast. We all have imperfections that we bring to our leadership. What imperfections? I love it. I love yeah. It. Well, it's that. It's, I, I mean, I, when I first saw that, I thought, oh, that's interesting. I was curious where it was going to go. So I'm glad you asked that question. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, you, you know, there's no such thing as perfection in, in any music. I mean, I, I think that uh, when I first started out, uh, um, and, and I think this goes back to my heart again, is that I tried to write what I thought I was supposed to write. And, and I tried to be very sort of perfect in sort. Uh, uh, and, and in a sense, I was losing my, my own uh, mojo. I don't know what, really what the right word is, but my own soul and my own what made me who I am. And I think that as, you know, when we, as we grow into our lives and we start becoming professionals, uh, we have to to succeed, you have to find that part of yourself that resonates within yourself, as opposed to just trying to imitate or be like everyone else, you know? And I think that that, my, 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 uh, I didn't know that until I was probably in my late twenties, because I thought I was supposed to be sort of perfect in, in the sense of doing it just the way other people were doing it and had to fall in a certain box. And once I became imperfect, then my people would, 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 uh, recognize that sense of, of reality and realness to myself, to my inner core. And I think that anyone in almost any field, once they attain that, that's when they start doing their best work. So I, I think that's what, how I would answer that question. I, I, by becoming imperfect and, and not, you know, this per perfect is, is uh, people sort of describe what they think perfection is. And, and I was trying to fit myself into a certain mold. And once I became imperfect and let myself become elastic or the elasticity of sorts of, of my soul and my intellectual look at life. It, it just really just opened up a whole new world for me inside. And I think that, you know, I think that that could be parallel to, to business. It could be parallel to any kind of art, um, to writing, to whatever it might be. So I think that's a, a turning point in my life that I'm really glad that I had because, you know, uh, it was just, a, I remember it was a big turning point for me. Yeah. Well, and I love the way that you framed that, now, my next question, I know that you've stated that music is your passion and it's been a vehicle for you for the creation of a better world. I would love for you to share with the listeners how you felt when you were asked to compose a song. And I know you composed a song with Mike Greenley called Always My Angel. After yes. the, the tragedy at Sandy Hook when, yes. when, when that trauma happened. How did it feel to be asked, and, and just kind of share with us, where did that, as you say, vehicle of creation go for you in the creation of that song with Mike and just carrying out that request? Yes, well, um, first of all, so it, it's losing someone is something we all, are, are a part of. And obviously that kind of a tragedy was just particularly uh, devastating. And um, when I was approached to do that, I had been working with Mike a lot. I, I worked quite a bit with him and, and I thought that he would be a really um, a collaborator to, to work on those lyrics. Um, and I think that, you know, any kind of a tragedy like that obviously is just so difficult, but like anything, we, we try to find some sort of 
uh, maybe positivity is the wrong word, but some sort of inspiration and and uh, helping us evolve in some way when something like that happens. And uh, my wife actually passed away in um, 2007, so I'm certainly familiar with loss, and my children had a really hard time with it, obviously. And it, so that sort of tied into it. And and uh, and I thought with with, with, with first graders dying um, like that, I thought, my gosh, you know, obviously their spirit is just so uh to, to, to sort of understand the fact that they will always be part of us um and and that so the the song kind of evolved that way and then i was working with mike on something and i thought you know what mike i think you'd be really good to work on this so he's um and he's just a very heartfelt kind of a person himself he he thinks and writes with his heart and that's what i like about his writing um and and it turned into that and then i mean i had my daughter sing the first demo of it i'll never forget it um and it was just so deeply resonant for her because she of course was thinking about her mother and 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 it just it all just kind of came together and we're just actually i i, I was going to publish it way back then but i thought you know it, it just wasn't really the right time and now i feel like it's really uh it's really a, a a good time um to do that um so it's actually just about to come out like maybe next week uh available for choir so we're pretty excited about it but so that's the essence of what it was and and it was an honor for me to be able to work with these uh, with the, with this idea. And I ended up doing a songwriting workshop with the first, gra first graders when they were in sixth grade, five years after the tragedy, which was an incredible uh, opportunity for me as well. But anyway, that's where, that's where it came out of and that, that, that's how it evolved. What a lovely full circle moment for you. I'm, I'm sitting here with, with tears in my eyes right now, Jim. I, I didn't realize that your daughter uh, was involved in singing that song. So what a beautiful moment for you, not only professionally, but kind of full circle on, on a family personal note as well. That's, that's very beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Now, yeah. I'm going to throw in an extra question here because I know that it is your life's mission with all that you do with with your work with with music what was your decision to start the foundation for small voices and share with us what has evolved with this organization sure so it was in 2000 it's actually our 20th anniversary this year um and i was doing film scores and television commercials and pop music and and I, I was doing pretty well, and, and I finally, uh, you know, it was hard in the beginning, but then I stuck with it, and then, um, so I, I started doing a lot better, and I thought, you know, uh, I, I don't want to just do jingles my whole life, I mean, you know, and make money, and there's so much more to life, and and, and I, and so we thought, you know, let's, um, let, let, let's think of an organization that we can really, really help and really change, so we looked around for foundations to give money to, we raised money on, on some projects. And everywhere we went, you know, it was like, well, this foundation, you know, they raised a million dollars and they spent eight hundred and eighty thousand dollars on salaries, and then they gave away ninety thousand dollars, and and then all these other organizations. And I talked to our, we talked to our accountant, and we said, well, how can we be sure that the money we raise goes directly to, uh, to to these these music um, programs in need? And they said, well, the only way to really do it is to let's create our own foundation. Uh, we'll be 100% volunteer, the executive director, the web designer, the lawyer, everybody. And they said, look, if you don't want to do it, you don't do it. But if you want to be involved with the organization, every single dollar we raise. So so that's how we started out. And we, we went and we approached uh, Hyatt uh, because they were uh, they could get us plane fares and hotels and all that. I mean, for for uh, um, as a sponsor. And they they heard the idea and they were just fascinated with it and, and sponsored our first concert. Uh, at Carnegie Hall to kick it off back at the first concert of the millennium actually in 2000 um, and that's how it began and now since then and we were going to be traveling a lot and then 9-11 happened so we decided to do a little bit more fundraising um, you know virtually of sorts and then I do a lot of songwriting workshops with with youth so we raise quite a bit of money we're we're, we're uh, funding a, uh, a, a school in um, in Uganda right now and I was supposed to go over there in November for three weeks but now, of course, that was canceled as as I have about 50 trips for me. Um, but we we are constantly, you know, we understand and we we all believe in the power of music and the importance of music in a child's life. And to, for a child to have a music program cut, it just seems to be ridiculous to us. So we try to fund as many programs as we can. Um, but I think that uh, the main reason why we started it is that we feel that music is just so important, and and you can't really quantify what music is in a child's life. And a lot of times, the arts programs are being cut first. 
or we feel that really those are the programs that we really need to have to create a whole human being. And we think it's just incredibly important, not necessarily to be a music person or a music major, but to be a, you know, a person who listens, a person who is compassionate, a person who understands beauty. And we just think it just translates so much to different parts of the world. Um, and it's just essential. So that, that to me, that that's how it evolved. And then uh, my wife, when she passed away in 2007, had a 10 year plan. So we followed her plan for about five or six more years after that. And now we're, we're sticking with it and we're really excited that it's still, still there. And, and uh, we, we, we've been doing some really uh, incredible um, concerts and, 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 and resonant. Now, of course, it's got it gotten into a virtual world, which has been an interesting world for me. I've been doing a lot of songwriting workshops virtually with choirs from all over the world. And it's just been incredible on zoom. I've written uh, since March, let me think March 26 was my first one. I've done about 30 of them since then. So I've, I've had the opportunity to meet with thousands of children from all over the world and country and states. Um, and it's just uh, been an amazing, uh, you know, segue into the virtual world. And that's what we're doing right now. So we're really excited about it. Well, that sounds fantastic. And I will uh, ensure that we put the information for the foundation on the episode description for for everyone to check it out and that's what i love about technology so even though you're not jumping on a plane you're still making a difference with with zoom and and doing everything virtually so amazing yeah yeah now yeah. how how do you think my last question how do you think music has helped you during covid 19 and is there any strategies around music that you would share with our listeners well, uh, there's a big uh, sort of problem of sorts right now with choral directors because they're, they're saying that the worst thing you can do for COVID is to be in a room with 30 other people singing, you know, in a closed room, which is what my entire life and what, what, what thousands and thousands of choirs throughout the world have been. So we're trying to find different ways to resonate. Um, and and uh, the way that, that, you know, so concerts have stopped. I mean, they, we have virtual concerts where people can record in their homes and then they send in their tracks and they make these virtual choirs, which is fine. And it's certainly better than nothing, but there's going to be a huge piece missing. So we, we, we are constantly trying to find ways to, you know, stimulate the creativity in, in youth. And the, what we have discovered and what we've found that works really well is the, is being able to songwrite together. So I've been leading a lot of those songwriting sessions and I've also developed an entire curriculum for virtual songwriting for classes um, that I, I worked on all summer. I, I met with probably 300 choir directors and I said, what can we do to help you with your situation? They said, well, if you could give us a songwriting curriculum, because I can only do so many physical ones. Um, but so I've developed a songwriting, a songwriting curriculum um, that, it, that uh, choirs can use all over the world and they can they can that they they can a sense do what i'm doing so i'm trying to trying to teach what i have learned over by doing this for 20 years and and put it into a songwriting curriculum so they can actually use it in their classroom so that's kind of excited that's starting to to uh, become popular in schools and we're really and we answer questions whatever they need so that's the way it has evolved when is when is there going to be a I, I i have just had my 53rd concert cancel on me because you know clearly there are no concerts and my first concert that I have is scheduled for all my January, all my February, one in the end of March. So maybe that'll happen, but I don't even know. I mean, it might be next summer before we have, you know, concerts and singing. So we do have to try to evolve as, as creative people who are trying to inspire these, these children um, and not lose the magic of what music can do to them. So that's our, that, that's our solution right now is, is being able to be creative with one another and they'll be able to sing their songs via the, you know, on their phone and they sit down and create a, a virtual choir of sorts by songwriting. And I, I have uh, my Zoom, you know, the chat feature on Zoom. I, I, I hope to one day publish a book about about these Zoom calls that I've had starting uh, literally a, a week after the society in March, March 20 something was, was that's when everything started closing down certainly in the United States and, and all my zoom calls I print out and I have, I have about three, 400 pages of thoughts of youth as the COVID is happening. Then as the whole thing is happening with the race relations and, you know, everything that, that is going through in these children's minds and to be able to express it through music and thought. So I have a whole book 
of, of thoughts of what these people, what these young people are thinking week to week as, as our society was evolving. And it's just, to me, it's a, it's an historic time, obviously, like uh, no one has lived through anything like 2020. Um, and uh, anyway, so it's just kind of magical. So I read it for inspiration sometimes just to get songs and it's, it's, it's inspiring to me what, what's, what's, what's going on in, the, in their minds. So that's, that's a way that we're trying to contribute in some way. Oh, that's beautiful. And I, I can only imagine reading that and when you need to gain some inspiration or just have a few moments of reflection. So there might be a future song or a book there, Jim, I'm thinking. Absolutely, for sure. Yeah. So I like to end the, pa the podcast with what I call my Fab Four. And these are just four fun questions. And whatever's sitting on the top of your mind. It's those kind of questions where someone asks you and it's whatever's sitting right there, okay? Okay. My first question is, what is your favorite memory? Gosh, um, I would have to say, um, you, you're not talking about professionally, you just mean in general. Just in right. general, yep. All right, all right, I'll tell you. Well, my daughter was about three and I had been on tour for about three weeks and that's an attorney when you have a three-year-old and I wanted to spend every one minute with her. We were up at the beach in Maine and she took me out at around six in the morning and uh, we went outside and she, she was walking me through her world of imagination. And she said, you know, this is the, the, uh, the kingdom where the princes and the princesses. And she had this big log and she said, these are the mountains and this is the, the seaweed was there. And she said, and these are the thorns. And I, I wanted to jump in with the game. And I said, I saw this beautiful flat rock. And I said, and this is the magic carpet that the prince can take to go over the mountain to go see the prince, uh, uh, see the princess. And she looked at me and she put her hands on her hip and she goes, that's a rock. <laughs> you know, <so. laughs> I'll never forget it. The, the, here you are trying to join in and then the logic came. It's like, what are you saying, Dad? That's, right. that's a great... What are you talking about? That's a rock. Are you crazy? Yeah, anyway. That's just a remember great really memory. <laughs> now, I know, I know my next question might be hard, but if I had to ask you, what is your favorite song of all time? What's the first one that comes to your mind? In the history of, of any artist? Yes, Oh my gosh. Um, wow, that's such a hard one. I, I would say probably, uh, I mean, it's maybe a cliche answer, but it just, it feels so good when I hear it is the Beatles, here comes the sun. You know, I would have to say that. I would have to say the Beatles, here comes the sun. That's a great song. Mm -hmm. If I asked you to compose a song for 2020, what would the title be? Um, where do we go from here? <laughs> right? <laughs> That's a good one. It's so funny. Right? When I, um, when I was uh, interviewing Mike Greenlee a couple of weeks ago, he surprised me. His favorite song was um, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, which I love. And we yeah. had a similar conversation. And his his song would be don't stop believing because he also likes that song by journey so he just he he was sure. staying in that hope tunnel so that's a good one yeah. and my last yeah. my last question jim is what do you want your legacy to be i mean i guess for my music to live on and and, and let people experience the uh i mean i try to spend as much time as i can around around children and, and youth and and hopefully that will translate into uh for many people for generations to come to be able to experience that so i guess it's uh to be able to help people get inspired by by music and and, and the power of music and words together i suppose that that's what i would want it to be you know well and i i certainly think that you've done that and just what you've done to date is is phenomenal so even though you're not traveling you're virtually traveling and you're making such a difference uh to youth all over the world and it was such a delight to talk and interview you again so thanks for spending time and sharing your expertise with us today yeah my pleasure yeah absolutely i love to end my podcast with five things that 
I think are essential for living a purposeful life. Follow your heart, have passion, do your best, know your truth, and always be in love with the journey. This is Deb Crow. Thanks for joining me once again on Imperfect, the heart-centered leadership podcast.